we have uh, finished discussing most of the aspects of the common source amplifier. We know how to make the common source amplifier, but uh, as I mentioned in the previous class, our final goal will be to use it in feedback circuits. Okay. So, soon after this we will see examples of feedback circuits for biasing and towards the end of the course the complete operational amplifier or the op amp. Okay. Now, in order to do that properly uh, to see exactly how feedback systems behave, we also need to take into account memory effects in the system that is we have to include uh, uh, capacitors that exist. Okay. Our circuits so far do have capacitors but they are designed in a way that uh, for the signal frequencies they behave like short circuits and at least as far as we were concerned so far they were irrelevant. Okay. So, we just short them and move on. Now, the capacitors I am talking about are somewhat different. So, I will show uh, first let us analyze the effects of that, uh, move on to some of the feedback circuits we use for biasing and then see what happens when you have these capacitors inside a feedback network. Okay. Because uh, finally, I mean our common source amplifier does provide amplification, but its gain is likely to be modest because the internal uh, output resistance of the MOS transistor limits the gain to maybe 20, 30 something like that. Okay, Certainly not more than 100. So, it turns out that we have to use multiple amplifiers and when we have multiple amplifiers and these memory effects, it turns out that we have problems. Okay. So, first let us go back to the common source amplifier. Now, I will sometimes draw pictures like this with the MOS transistor, but obviously in this case I am not showing the biasing picture and so on. So, it is assumed that you have to replace the small signal linear equivalent of the MOS transistor in its place. Okay. In essence, this is all that is there in the common source amplifier. Now, we know that because of biasing, we have something here and also likely to be something over there. Okay. But instead of uh, having all these things which only complicate the algebra, they do not essentially change anything because as R 1 parallel R 2 what it does is you can always represent this entire combination as yet another voltage source in series with a resistance. Okay. It is only the value of the voltage source that is changed. And similarly, this R D parallel R L can be thought of as the effective load resistor. So, nothing is lost by removing these things for now okay, for the present discussion. Now, with this picture, what is the output voltage? What is the output voltage? No, it is not GMRL, what is it? Minus GMRL, okay. so please always mind the sign, minus GMRL times V i. Okay. And this expression has no frequency dependence at all. That is whether you have uh, 1 hertz or 1 gigahertz. As long as the picture looks like this, the gain looks like that. Okay. So, there is no frequency dependence. Why? No, it is not. No, I mean our model of the MOS transistor has no frequency dependence, right. I d is a function of V g s. So, the partial derivative also has no other So, this has no frequency dependence at all. Now, it turns out that the MOS transistor, earlier I had described how the MOS transistor works, it is essentially a capacitor. This is metal, this is the so called oxide and this is the semiconductor that is the MOS. Right? Now, uh, it is essentially a capacitor. A capacitor, you apply voltage across the capacitor to modulate the amount of uh, carriers available for conduction in the semiconductor. Okay. So, without going any further into the details, we expect that there will be some capacitance present in the MOS transistor. Okay. It has to be there, just inherent in the behavior of the MOS transistor as a capacitor. Okay. So, that is one thing. And in general, when you have any pair of conductors, there will be some capacitance between them. Of course, if they are far apart, the capacitance will be small. If they are very close, there will be there is a large overlapping area, then the capacitance will be large and so on. But 
as long as you have two finite sized I mean non zero sized conductors at some distance you will have some capacitance ok. So, you do expect to see capacitances everywhere in the circuit in general if you have a circuit with uh, 10 nodes between every node and every other node there will be some capacitance. Of course, if you throw in all the capacitances it becomes difficult to analyze. So, we will uh, use the most important ones ok. So, inside a MOS transistor in saturation region. So, inherent to the operation of the MOS transistor that is this is just what the MOS action requires ok the gate the oxide and the semiconductor, but you do have to make the contacts to the drain physical contacts to the drain gate and source ok you have to draw wires from them. So, those wires also will have capacitances between them. So, generally you distinguish between two types of capacitors one that is inherent to the device and one that is extrinsic that is say I mean the extrinsic stuff also has to be there because what is a MOS transistor if you cannot make contact to it ok. So, you have to have uh, wires connecting to it and those wires will have capacitances between them ok. So, I will show the intrinsic capacitors first turns out that between gate and source there is a capacitor obviously denoted CGS ok. So, that is mainly the capacitance that appears in saturation uh, let me may redraw that. In general there will be two intrinsic capacitors between gate and source and gate and drain ok. Now, as you expect when V d s is 0 everything is completely symmetrical you cannot distinguish between drain and source ok. So, then it turns out that C G S and C G D are equal to each other and that is equal to half of the capacitance of the MOS transistor ok. So, again we would not use this expression by itself because we will just take some parasitic capacitor value and go ahead with the calculations. But at least you can see that what is W L? It is the area of the gate ok. I earlier showed you the plan view of the MOS transistor. We will show it here. The current flows this way. The width of the cross section across which the current flows is W and the length along which it flows is the length which is the separation between drain and source that is L ok. So, if you have a plate like this and another plate on the bottom obviously, its capacitance will be proportional to W times L it is the parallel plate capacitor area right. So, W times L and C ox is nothing but the capacitance per unit area it is not the capacitance, but capacitance per unit area it is some inherent property of the MOS transistor. It is the same C ox that appears in the other expression for the current that is mu and C ox and so on ok. And when V d s equals 0 a drain and source are uh, indistinguishable and these capacitances are apportioned half to the source and half to the drain ok. Now, we extend this a little further and say that this is true in all of triode region actually these capacitances also are dependent on the signal ok dependent on the voltages the capacitors are nonlinear. So, they do vary with V g s and V d s. But if we take all of that into account again the picture becomes very complicated. So, we will say that this is true in triode region ok that is V d s smaller than V g s minus V t. And in saturation region it turns out that this comes out of uh, calculations that you will later see in device physics. The gate to source capacitance is two thirds of the W L C ox product and gate to drain capacitance is 0 
okay again this is some simple model for the capacitances okay so as far as this yeah so what happens is the following let's say this is the semiconductor and this is the capacitor this is just a parallel plate now and this dimension is l and this dimension is w okay so what is the capacitance of it if the unit area capacitance is c ox what's the total capacitance wl times c ox okay but we have the drain terminal at this end and the source terminal at that end okay so normally if you take it as a two terminal element that is one terminal is here gate and the other terminal is over here okay that it will just be a two terminal capacitor the normal capacitor with a total capacitance of wl c ox okay now we have three terminals source and drain and the actual capacitance is distributed i mean you can kind of divide this into sections there is a capacitance here there is a little capacitance there little capacitance there and so on okay now how do you now how do you apportion it to these three terminals gate source and drain okay when the charge distribution inside here is symmetric you just say that half of it belongs to the source and other half belongs to the drain that's all because we have a three terminal element and we can't say that it's really between gate and source or gate and drain okay it's really between both it's a distributed capacitance between both when the charges are symmetric which is true only when vds exactly equals zero you can say that half of it is uh, you can connect half of it to the drain and half of it to the source so what really happens is as you go from uh, triode to saturation region that is as you increase the value of vds from zero the portion that is kind of attached to the source increases and the portion attached to the drain decreases and when you reach the edge of uh, saturation region there is nothing connected to the drain okay so again we are not into the discussion of the physics or the, any of the model details we take the model for granted but the ccd equal to 0 it makes some intuitive sense or at least you can make an intuitive connection between this and the fact that in the saturation region the drain voltage has no effect on the current okay so the drain voltage has no effect on the current because it has no effect on charges inside the mos transistor okay so that's why the capacitance apportioned to the drain is zero right and the gate source voltage is the only thing that controls the charges inside the mos transistor in saturation so that is the only capacitance that is there so you can kind of think of the charge layer inside the mos transistor being attached equally to the drain and source in triode region when uh, vds equals zero and then the picture becomes skewed as it goes towards saturation and in saturation region the entire charge layer gets attached to the source and nothing gets attached to the drain it's the same phenomena the same thing causes ccd equal to zero and the drain voltage not to have any effect on the current okay cds cds there is no cds well there will be cds but not intrinsic to the mos transistor okay because we connect wires there will be capacitances between every pair of terminals okay but uh, intrinsic to the operation of the mos transistor in the first order model or the zero th order model we have these are the capacitors okay uh, yeah. no in our case we have uh, a three terminal device okay in that case there is definite uh, breaking of symmetry and again i don't want to go too much into the device details so what you do is the following okay so you here you have the source terminal here you have the drain terminal okay so the mos transistor is in reality a four terminal device and the fourth terminal is over here so the substrate something has to be connected now we use a three terminal model by connecting these two okay so whichever side we connect the bulb to that is the source so for us there is no ambiguity there is only one that can be the source if you do treat it as a four terminal device it's a perfectly symmetric device and the only way to distinguish between source and drain is to actually evaluate which voltage is higher whichever voltage is higher is the drain the other one is the source in our case we tie these two things together 
we also restrict the voltages. I already told you that the, all the models that we carry that we described are valid only with VDS greater than 0, okay. So, for us, yeah, this is unambiguously the drain that is the source, the source is attached to the pole, okay. No, that is how it is done, okay. Right, it has to be connected somewhere, this is one of the possible ways and it is the common way also. And the other thing is we do not want to deal with the complexities of the 4 terminal MOS model, okay. So, everything that we want to learn now can be described equally well with the 3 terminal model and also the bipolar transistor is truly a 3 terminal device and this and that can be treated in a uniform way if we stick to this, okay. Most of the times you use this model although it is oversimplified, okay. And typically even if the bulk is not connected to the source, it will be connected to some fixed potential in the circuit. Any questions? Okay. So, again do not worry too much about the device details, but uh, I have just kind of uh, given a baby level description of what the MOS transistor does. So, in saturation region which is where our amplifiers will be operating, there will be CGS and no CGD, okay. But because any pair of wires will have some capacitance between them, there will be extrinsic capacitances between the gate and source. I mean you will have some contacts and there will be some capacitance and also between gate and drain and also between drain and source, okay. So, although the intrinsic capacitor is only between gate and source, we have all three possible capacitors, okay, in a MOS transistor. And in addition to that, in a common source amplifier, it the load does not need to be just a resistance, it can also have a capacitance, okay. So, in a common source amplifier basically we have these two terminals, the input and output and the ground and there will be capacitance between every pair of terminals, that is the bottom line, okay. So, I just tied it to the device capacitances, but in general there will be capacitances between every pair of terminals, is okay. Now, we do not want to go on uh, writing different symbols for these two pairs of uh, capa these two capacitors and then adding them together because they are in parallel and they will be the same. I mean sorry, they will always be added together. So, this combined stuff is what I will call CGS, this combined stuff is what I will call CGD and this one we will see, okay. This is fine. So, in every circuit there will be capacitances between every pair of nodes. Of course, some of them will be more significant, the ones that are close together, some you can neglect. And you should, if you want to be able to analyze any circuit at all, you have to be able to neglect many capacitors. Uh, and uh, in a MOS transistor, the significant capacitance and saturation is between gate and source, although there will be something between gate and drain. That gate drain capacitance will be small, but its effect will not be small I'll, as we will see later, okay. No, the red is because of uh, wires that are connecting to the device, not because of the device itself. You can imagine the device in complete isolation, then it will not be there, okay. But I mean there is no such thing because as long as anything has non-zero physical dimensions, you will have capacitance in that sense everything. V, that is V d s equal to, this is in uh, VDS equal to 0 makes the charge distribution inside symmetrical, that is why I wrote that, but like I said we will take that model to be true all over triode region, okay. But I mean it is also not relevant because most of the time we will almost never have the transistor in triode region, all our amplifiers will use devices in the saturation region, okay. Any questions on this? The very least you should be convinced that the MOS transistor has some capacitance, its value is 2 thirds WLC oxygen saturation region. And in a circuit, you can expect capacitances between every pair of nodes. Exactly what effect they will have, that is what we are going to study, okay. Again, this is just a signal picture, I will omit the bias picture for now. I will also call this capacitor CGS. The MOS transistor is there by itself, it will be the CGS. It will also include any extrinsic capacitance, some other capacitance that may be there as part of the source or the transistor or anywhere in the circuit, okay. 
we don't have to label all those things separately finally we just have to compute the total capacitance that exists between this point and ground and substitute that value for cgs okay so i'll call it cgs just to identify it with the mos transistor and similarly here i'll call this the load capacitor that includes whatever capacitance is part of the load the load will have some capacitance okay for instance if the load is a speaker there'll be speaker cables and they'll have some capacitance and so on okay and of course it also includes any capacitance that may be contributed by the mos transistor itself okay now for now i'll ignore the capacitance between gate and drain okay so if i have vi and vo how would you analyze the circuit when you have capacitors what do you do what do you do how do you analyze the circuit what do you do what is the method that you normally use yeah you have to use the you have to use phasor analysis or laplace transforms laplace transforms is nicer to write because instead of writing j omega everywhere you can write s okay after that while plotting you can substitute so please evaluate v not of s by v i of s that is this is called the transfer function of the circuit okay please evaluate this and assume the usual model for the mos transistor and you can ignore gds because after all even if it is there that can be included in the load resistance okay so the mos transistor consists only of some transconductance gm okay so please evaluate this yeah what's the transfer function minus gm rl 1 plus l cgs rs 1 plus s cl rl okay so it is a second order transfer function what is the sanity check you can use to see whether this is correct and some known result exactly so if the capacitors are not there the gain should be minus gm rl or dc gain is minus gm rl that is correct okay so it is a second order transfer function there are two capacitors but actually it's really a cascade of two first order transfer functions i mean it is second order but if you call this phase uh, if you call this voltage vgs then vgs by vi would be what 1 by 1 plus s cgs rs okay so these uh, results about first order uh, systems and so on you should no okay not by memorizing it but by working out enough problems that these things you should know okay and similarly v not by vgs will be minus gm rl by 1 plus scl rl okay so it's a second order transfer function and in this of course any ac coupling capacitor will also have some effect on the response but that we have ignored we have assumed that those capacitors are infinitely large and they do behave like short circuits okay now i think you know what is coming so please plot v not by vi as a function of omega that is the bode plot on a log log scale and the angle on a log linear scale and just for uh, illustration let's imagine that cgs rs is more than cl rl it doesn't matter just don't make them equal so that you can see the distinct parts please draw the magnitude and phase plots or the bode plot of this transfer function what does the magnitude plot look like at very low frequencies constant what is the value of the constant gmrl yeah now when i say log scale it's really the value itself that you plot not log of that it's just graduated in a logarithmic way okay this will be gmrl and what happens after a while starts falling assuming that there are two poles here right one at minus 1 by cgs rs and 1 at 1 by minus 1 by cl rl okay you have done these things right magnitude and phase plots and network and systems and so on we did it in emc but i mean 
networks also you should have done that so i say many of you explicitly writing down the magnitude as square root of 1 plus omega square and so on which is fine that's correct but uh, if you take this long then you will be in trouble because we have to use this for every circuit okay i mean when you want to add uh, 1 plus 4 you don't go 1 2 3 4 right <laughs> so similarly this you should know it will start falling at a rate of minus 20 db per decade and these are known as break points of the bode plot in reality it won't be a combination of straight line segments like this far away from the break point it will be straight at that point it will have a curve it's minus 3 db it's also actually affected by the other pole but we ignore that okay what is that now this is minus 20 db per decade after the second pole it falls to minus 40 db per decade okay now which is first which is second it's completely dependent on the values i will for now assume that this is 1 over cgs rs and this is 1 by cl rl there is no reason why they should be more than that they could be equal also in which case there will be only one break point and it will fall off at minus 40 db per decade okay what does the angle look like what is the angle at very low frequencies pi because the gain is negative okay starts from pi and here it approximately reaches uh, 3 pi by 4 and if the poles are far away there will be a region where you can see pi by 2 and here it reaches pi by 4 and eventually go up to 0 okay so that's what it looks like so this uh, business of drawing bode plots and so on you should be familiar with because later while analyzing feedback systems we will be using it all the time okay so right now all we need to know is that yeah it behaves like an amplifier up to a certain frequency okay which is decided by the pole which is decided by the capacitances in the circuit okay now if you also include the effect of ac coupling capacitors it will not start from zero frequency it will start from some non zero frequency right because at dc the gain will be zero the capacitors are open circuits okay so if i also included that part here somewhere here you would get something like that okay so let me not worry about it if you can also put the whole thing together and then analyze it if you wish uh so there is some uh, range of frequencies there is some sort of bandwidth for the system uh, over which you get a gain of minus gmrl and beyond that the gain falls off and the phase also uh, the phase is pi which is the desired value the gain should be minus gmrl but the phase will go off to 0 degrees at very high frequencies essentially you can if you go well beyond this pole the amplifier is kind of inactive it won't give you any significant output signal okay yes yeah the angle just uh, falls off right for each pole each pole will contribute a phase lag of 90 degrees so it starts from pi goes to pi by 2 and then goes to 0 no no not several sections but uh, maybe i didn't draw it very neatly that's all so if i had only the first pole should be like that if i had only one pole if i had only the other pole it would be like that so the total phase lag is sum of the two so which will be roughly that's all that's it okay if the poles are very far apart then at these points at the pole values you will have a phase lag of uh, i mean phase of uh, 3 pi by 4 and pi by 4 okay but if the poles are close together you can't distinguish between those two regions okay so right now this is just an exercise uh, what we take from here is that the amplifier will not give you amplification up to infinite frequencies there is some finite range of frequencies over which it will do that and the bandwidth is decided by the poles in the system and in general you can take the lower of the two poles to be the bandwidth in this case i have taken it to be 1 over cgs rs and this is in radians per second by the way okay is this fine any questions about this
it has a, a gain of GMRL only up to a certain frequency. Okay, so that is the bandwidth. The bandwidth is basically a range of frequencies over which the system behaves in the desired way, whatever the desire is. Okay. So this, uh, I mean, so far as we are concerned, now we just put the capacitors and we calculated the transfer function and the Bode plot. All of these you should become fluent with, so that we can do it for more complex systems. Okay. So now, let me also introduce this CGD. Okay. So what happens to the transfer function? What will be the order of the transfer function? Third order. First order. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. What is the highest possible answer you could give? 3, at least only 3 capacitors. So, if you say more than 3, then there is something wrong. Okay. But what is the answer? What is the order of the system? I mean, what is the order? 0. Okay. This minus 1, anyone? What is the order of the system? What is the meaning of the order of the system? Yeah, in the transfer function, the highest power of the denominator that is the order. So, what will it be for this case? We do have 3 capacitors. If we have n capacitors, what will be the order of the system, order of the transfer functions in the system? But okay, I mean, say something little more concrete than that, right? At most n, okay. So, now it is at most 3. So, is it 3? Maybe 2. Why? So one uh, uh, practical way of determining the order is to see how many independent independent initial conditions you can impose. You can impose initial conditions on the capacitor voltages and inductor currents. Okay. So, the number of independent initial conditions will be the same as the order. Okay. So, what is that? How many is that? Why? So, there is a loop of capacitors. So, if you let us say you think of it as imposing initial conditions, you fix this voltage and that voltage, the other one is already fixed. Okay. So, when you have a loop of capacitors, then the order will be one less because one of the capacitor voltages can be determined from the other ones. Okay. So, again these type of problems you would have seen in EMC and also probably networks and systems. Same thing happens with inductors. If you have something like this that is 3 inductors whose current sum to 0, it may not exactly be like this, but in some way their current will sum to 0 Then clearly you can only specify 2 of the inductor currents, the third one will be automatically determined, order will be 1 less. Okay. So, the highest order you can have in a circuit is the total number of capacitors plus inductors. Okay. So, are all of you convinced that this will be a second order transfer function? Yeah. What is the transfer function? Please evaluate the transfer function okay, and go about it systematically. Let me give you some hints. First, long, long ago in a land far away, you may have heard of nodal analysis and so on. So, if you use that, it will be easier. Okay. And also, the input can be rewritten as the Norton equivalent, sorry, as a sum of, uh, sorry, as a parallel combination of current source and resistance. And also, here instead of resistance, I have used conductances. Okay. So, GS is 1 by RS. Again, that is easier when you do nodal analysis, right, because you have the conductance matrix. You have CGS. You can do this in any way you want. Okay, all you have to do is to write the KVL and KCL equations and solve for it. But it can be painful enough. So again, for load, I am specifying the conductance GL, which of course is one by RL. This is GM VGS, and this will be CGD. Okay. And let us say this is node 1 and node 2. If I call this V1 and this one is V2 or VO, okay. the nodal equations are written as conductance matrix times 
the vector of uh, unknown node voltages equals the vector of source currents ok. So, you can try it in any way you want, but for now just try it with nodal analysis in my opinion that is the easiest way to do it. So, first help me fill out the entries of the conductance matrix and the source vector ok. What is it? What is this entry here? Do you remember nodal analysis? Do you remember the, there was something called nodal analysis? What is it? What is this? What is the first entry? All the conductance in this case admittances because we have frequency dependent quantities as well. So, what is the total? Huh? What is that? G s that is it. What is it? Yeah. You yeah. Yeah, what is that? Huh? Yeah, what do I do with SCGS man? I mean to GS and that is all, it is just sum of admittances, right? They are all in parallel S, CGS and then plus ok. Then this one it is the negative of the admittance between node 1 and node 2. So, that is minus S C G D and this one minus S C G D this one what is that? G L plus S C G D. We're done. Where is G M? Where should be G M? Which entry? Two one. Yeah. So this, of course, when you have only admittances, it will consist of only admittances. This is the the diagonal elements will be the total admittance to that node, the off diagonal ones will be admittances between negative of the admittance between corresponding nodes. When you do have control sources, the matrix does become asymmetrical. Uh, essentially, this entry is telling you the effect of node 1 on the current set node 2, right. So, node 1 injects the voltage at node 1 affects the current set node 2 by injecting current through CGD as well as from GM, ok. And by convention, all of these nodal equations are written with the sum of currents flowing away from the node. So, this will be plus G m ok. And what about the source vector on the right side? V i G s second one 0. It is basically each one is the independent current source that is flowing into that node. So, it is V i G s and 0. So, now from this you should be able to calculate V naught by V i or you should get the expression for V naught ok and from the determinants and so on. So, please do that and put the result in a clean form and I think you also remember Kramer's rule where you do not have to completely invert the matrix. If you are interested only in V naught ok, what do you do? You it is the ratio of determinants, the determinant in the numerator is this with the source vector replacing the second one for V naught, for V 1 it will be the first one ok. And so, it will be the ratio of some determinant by the determinant of the admittance matrix ok. So, please evaluate this. So, what do you get when you simplify everything? You should get a second order denominator for sure and what do you get in the numerator? First order, there is actually some term containing S in the numerator and the sanity check you can use is what? 
Yeah, what should be the answer? What should be the answer if capacitance will disappear? Why is the MRL? Do you get that? So, check that. Okay. So, by tomorrow, please evaluate the expression and you should be able to draw the frequency plot of this. Okay. Find the roots and all that stuff. Okay.